Tonight, the Senate is expected to announce an NSA reform bill. Facebook pushes mobile users to Messenger. And OkCupid is conducting matchmaking experiments. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 138 for Monday, July 28th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Nature Box. Order great tasting healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy delicious treats like maple habanero pretzel pops. To get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Lane and let's get right into today's tech feed. Tomorrow is a potentially big day for privacy reform in the U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy is set to introduce a version of the USA Freedom Act that's stronger than what the House of Representatives passed earlier this year. The New York Times reports that the bill would halt the bulk surveillance of Americans' call metadata and also reforms the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to force some form of public disclosure of information regarding the court's decisions. The proposed bill would curb the telephony metadata program, but the NSA also has a ton of other surveillance tools demanding data from internet companies through PRISM, for example, and tapping fiber cables. The Senate bill has been put together in collaboration with the executive branch, which implies that the Obama administration has had some input, perhaps significant input. We passed along a story last week that online real estate listing service Zillow was in talks to buy competitor Trulia, and today it's official. Zillow will buy Trulia for around $3.5 billion in stock. Now, according to Comscore, last month Zillow reported 83 million users across both web and mobile. Trulia reported 54 million. Together, they make up about 61% of total internet users for their category. Until the deal closes, which is expected sometime next year, Zillow and Trulia will continue to compete with one another. In other acquisition news, Recode is reporting that Apple is close to buying the talk radio app Swell for around $30 million, citing multiple anonymous sources. As part of the deal, the Swell app is to be shut down, though at the time of recording, it's still available in Apple's App Store. It's a pretty good app, too. Last week, some Instagram users reported seeing what looked like an install ad for a forthcoming photo messaging app called Bolt. But an app called Bolt already exists, and the developer behind that app, which is a mobile voice app, has published a blog post urging Instagram to reconsider its name choice and avoid a legal battle in a blog post that he published today. TechCrunch reports that an app by the name of Bold is being launched by Instagram as another photo messaging app and is expected to hit the app store this week. And it isn't the first instance of Facebook taking an app name that already existed. You might recall that earlier this year, the company launched Paper, which is the same name as an already well-known app, Paper by 53. Very different though. One is news, one is art. The two apps currently coexist in the app store. In other Facebook news, the company is making good on a promise it made back in April when it announced it would remove messaging from its core mobile apps and force all chat activity to Messenger, its standalone app. Facebook isn't forcing anyone to download the Messenger app. It says you'll have several notices before messages are finally unbundled for good. And this is only for mobile users. Anyone who uses Facebook via the desktop will still have chat functionality in the main Facebook experience. Researchers at Stanford University have developed a new lithium battery that could last a lot longer than versions currently available in devices on the market. The new technique allows for denser, more efficient lithium in the battery's anode by using a nanoscopic carbon shield that stabilizes the chemical for a power pack that lasts longer on charge and doesn't decay as quickly. More engineering work is required before we see any shipping products, but... The days of barely getting through the day on a single charge might be history before we know it. Can't come soon enough. Mozilla interim CEO Chris Beard has been appointed full-time CEO by the corporation. He also joins the company's board of directors. Beard first joined Mozilla back in 2004, just in time for the first version of Firefox, Firefox 1.0, and previously spent some time as executive in residence at the venture capital firm Greylock Partners.
Coming up, the luxury hotel chain that's investing over half a billion dollars in smartphone door keys. And in just a few, I'm going to talk with Eric Limer from Gizmodo on how OkCupid is experimenting on its users. But first, I want to tell you about snacking. I love to snack. I think you should snack more. Don't be afraid. Just eat the right stuff from NatureBox. NatureBox snacks have no trans fat, zero high fructose corn syrup. That stuff really bad for you. Nothing artificial. And NatureBox sends great tasting snacks right to your door with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Here's how it works. Go to the website, click the continue button, and then you choose between three subscription options. You can select vegan or gluten conscious or nut free, non-GMO. They have lots Lots of choices depending on what you like to eat and what you can't eat. And then the next time you get hung hungry and you want to go to the vending machine, you've got Nature Box instead. Snack guilt-free PB&J granola. That one's really good. Bruschetta pretzel pops. Over 100 healthy snacks. If you'd like 50% off your first box, here's what you do. You just go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. And we thank NatureBox for the support of Tech News Tonight. 50% off. All right, joining us now is Eric Limer, associate editor over at Gizmodo. Hey, Eric. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming back on the show. I mentioned before the break that OkCupid is experimenting on users. OkCupid is a dating service. So what's going on here? Experimenting in what way? So basically, uh, in, a, in a blog post uh, on their uh, OK Trends blog, uh, one of the founders of OKCupid okay came out to explain that they've been uh, doing some things to uh, tweak the algorithm in very specific ways to try to figure out more about how people match together. And that's everything from, you know, sometimes uh, removing photos to suggesting that maybe couples are a better match than they would be otherwise, uh, changing... Uh, whether or not users are rated on appearance and personality or just one sliding scale and, and just little things like that, not on a wide scale, but just little little tests. Now, Facebook had a recent sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess you could call it a user uproar over their emotional manipulation surveys and tests that were being conducted without people really realizing that their news feeds might be handpicked to figure out how it affects us. Okay, Cupid though is is based a lot more on people that you don't know yet and possibly romantic matches. So, is there more of an implication of nefarious activity when you might potentially be matched with somebody who's not right for you and, you know, perhaps even worse? Um, I don't know. I think that what Okay Cupid is doing is totally is totally fine. Uh, considering that uh part what they've actually figured out is they're trying to they're trying to match people and it's not it's not an exact science right it's not like they are repl replicating some mathematical formula and that what they're doing by tweaking this algorithm is somehow like hiding an absolute truth right the way they match you is, is something that shifts and changes and what they found when they modified you know and inflated the percentage match scores that affects how well you're matched so i mean in a meta sort of way they're they're just affecting, it's all part of the same algorithm that's, that's affecting things. And I think because there's no, there's no base absolute, but like, yeah, of course they're going to mess with stuff. And I think that's totally fine. It's not surprising when I heard that this was happening with Facebook. Okay, Cupid, not, not either. The whole, the whole, if you're familiar with the site, which I am, yeah, the, the whole thing is, is, is based on algorithms and, and how well you are matched with somebody that, again, you potentially have never met before. But what does OkCupid okay gain from experimenting on users in this way? It, an algorithm gets stronger, but does it actually mean that the service works better? Um, I mean, I think they gain two things, uh, which are kind of uh, kind of work together and are kind of in conflict. Uh, on the one hand, they they find out how to match people better, which is is generally a good thing, right? Because if uh, if OKCupid gets a reputation for making good matches, more people are going to use it and, and whatnot. Uh, the other thing is they learn how to engage users more. Um, and those two, those two ends aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. So, you know, if OKCupid is using this information in a way that makes it a better service for the people who are using it, or um, and, and that engages users more, that's great. I think the, the only dangerous thing is if they use this information to find a way to 
sort of milk users to get them more engaged and, and see more ads and or get deeper into the OK Cupid ecosystem while actively making their matches worse. The blog post that sort of highlighted what OK Cupid was doing was written by one of the founders of OK Cupid, Christian Rudder. It's kind of tongue in cheek. Is this the sort of thing? Is, it, it has has OK Cupid done the right thing by saying you should know what we're doing, even though we're trying to be kind of fun about this? This is should should they have told users about this any sooner? Um, maybe I think again, generally transparency is is a good thing to have, but I I do think uh, a lot of what maybe drudged this up, and, and it still took a while is that all the the outcry to uh, to that Facebook stuff, I think, mm -hmm. you know, it might not have been as evident to people who are, you know, creating algorithms and changing algorithms that people are so freaked out by the fact that algorithms that are there are, are defining, uh, you know, what actually makes it in front of your eyes. Because that is, that's sort of the definition of an algorithm, right? right. Like, that's, that's, that's what they do. And I, I think it's definitely good that they came out and said it. And I think it's okay to be a little bit tongue-in-cheek about it because... Unless there's an expectation, like a Twitter-like expectation, that everything that's happening is 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 coming to you, if there is if there's a filter and it's not like an open source filter, I think you know we as users should expect that filter to be changing behind the scenes, you know, for for a whole number of purposes. Okay, Cupid is a free experience. Of course, it's ad supported. Facebook is another. Do you ever see? Do you foresee? some sort of a future where if somebody is up in arms enough about an algorithm that's manipulating the user, maybe paying a premium to get the fire hose version, more of a Twitter model where you see exactly what, uh, what, what you're going to see with less manipulation or how do you think that this plays out down the road? I mean, uh, see, I, I feel like offering a paid solution for for something that would give you no manipulation, I, I think that's fine. But so a paid solution that would give you less manu less manipulation, that suddenly becomes a problem, right? Because like uh, like what I was saying before with OK Cupid, that you know it is an algorithm that there's no you know platonic ideal of what it's supposed to be that they're kind of polluting, and if you end up having a paid model of the algorithm, it 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 creates this weird middle ground of things being filtered, but that's also, this is the canonical filtering. Eric Lammers, the associate editor over at Gizmodo, thanks so much for joining us, Eric, and let people know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, you can find me at uh, gizmodo.com, follow me on Twitter, uh, at Eric Lammer. Excellent, thanks so much, Eric. Thanks. All right, finally, we mentioned smartphones opening hotel doors. What's happening? Hilton Worldwide Holdings Incorporated, which is the parent company of Hilton Hotels, is investing $550 million to allow hotel guests to use their smartphones to choose rooms, check into rooms, and even unlock those doors to the rooms. The new technology will roll out to its 4,200 properties worldwide. By the end of the summer, travelers will be able to see the location of and select their own rooms by their smartphone at six brands, such as Hilton Garden Inn and the more luxury Waldorf Astoria. By next year, arriving guests will start being able to use their smartphones to unlock the doors to their rooms, which could help to sidestep front desk lines. And then the feature will be available to most of the company's hotels worldwide by the end of 2016. Just don't lose your smartphone because that's a very expensive key. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss Tech News Today. That's tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.